Life is so much better when he is the one who is exalted in our lives and we are not on the throne in our lives. This is why we need those moments, these moments when we gather together and we're reminded that he is the one who is exalted, that Jesus is the one whose name is above every name, who at the name of Jesus, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I need this moment and you need this moment. It's why we're gathered together with family, with friends in our homes today and reminding ourselves that he is the one who's exalted. Jesus, Lord, you are the name above every single name. You are high and exalted. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You do all that you please. And we are so grateful that you've invited us in to your kingdom, into a relationship with you that lasts forever. Lord, we want to exalt you this new week that you've given us. We want to exalt you with our lives, not just with our lips as we're singing today, but we want to exalt you with our lives. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Before we begin our message, I want you to watch this video that DK and I spent some time with Corey Maggette, who uh, played for many years in the NBA, and he's a great friend of our church. And we sat down and talked about faith and about fatherhood. So take a look at this clip. Man, I wanna hear, uh, how'd you choose basketball? I got like this passion, like, man, I wanna, I really wanna improve at this game. I was absolutely terrible, and I just kinda really worked at it from, from that remainder of time. For me, honestly, it wasn't even about playing professionally, it was just that I was really intrigued with the game of basketball, and from there, I just kinda had a passion, and my dad always tell me, hey, if you're gonna try to do something, work as hard as you can, put in the hard work. And then the, uh, your NBA career, Several different teams, but the, the longest stint was Clippers, right? Yes, longest stint was uh, was with the was with the Clippers. Had an unbelievable time, you know, as far as playing for that team, and you know, we made a run. It was yeah. the first time that this team had made it in the playoffs in you know over a decade, wow. I believe, and so you know we had a good run. There. Yeah, I know the NBA schedule, crazy, mm -hmm. eighty-two yes. games, and then also announcing. Mm -hmm. How have you know you have four kids? Yeah, how are you able to balance? you know, all of the uh, the responsibilities, both when you were playing, you know, and also now with announcing, with being a dad? Well, I must say, uh, in the beginning, I, I think it was more about, you know, uh, my wife really just kind of handling a lot of that. You know, I felt like I was very selfish because I was trying to play this game and trying to be the best that I can be. And when I first had, you know, my son Sergio, the perspective started to change, like, wow, you know, it's honestly not about me anymore, mm. it's about him. How, how have you grown as a dad in the last several years? You, you know what, I think it's really been based off of uh, my relationship with Christ have really changed. I remember walking in my closet and I got on my knees and I, I just started to just cry, man. It was almost like God really wrapped his arms around me. What like did you feel was changing quickly for you? You, you know what, I, I think it was um, maybe slow to anger, yeah. I would say, it is a huge thing bars. I'm always more of a very quiet person. And then if I was angry, I would get angry, right? And, um, and well, all of a sudden it started, I started to understand and, and start to read and see where God wants this anger to push this anger towards. So now I started to kind of push it towards let me open this book and start to get more knowledge. That's more. awesome, man. That really started to prompt me to be a better dad. Love that. So thinking further ahead, you know, when your kids, when they're adults, mm -hmm. when they look back at the time when they were in your home, 
what, what do you hope that they're gonna remember from you? You walk in character, you walk in integrity, and you know that Jesus loves you. Yes. Like, you know, every single day, you know, things will get tough, right? You know, you, it's gonna be yeah. like a hill. It's never gonna be the but same. But he's consistent. But the consistent part is, yeah. is, is God. If I can leave my kids with that, I feel like as a, as a parent, I, I've done my job. So grateful for Corey and the time that we got to spend together this last week. And you could think that because I'm hanging out with Corey McGetty that I'm a, I'm a pretty cool dad. I mean, you could, you could think that. But when you have kids, you realize that you get reminded that you are not a cool dad at all. I, I, my kids would not say I'm a cool dad. In fact, many times when I leave the house and I'm dressed for a day at the office or I'm going somewhere, one of my daughters <laughs> will look at me and say, ah, I don't like how you're dressed. I'm like, what do you mean? What's wrong with how I'm dressed? And she'll say, you look, you look like a, a dad. And I'm like, hey, listen, um, whatever DNA is in me that, chose, that caused me to choose this specific outfit, that DNA is in you too, all right? And so um, that is, I'm dressing this way. Whatever's causing me to dress this way, you are gonna end up dressing somewhat like this too one day. That's just the reality. But dad dresses typically not known as being uh, the most cool kind of dress. And we have some avatars I wanna show you from some different guys on our staff. And I want you to see how they are dressed. And I want you to think about your dad or maybe a dad in the room that you're watching this with. If you're hosting Mariners at your home this weekend, you can, you can try to guess which dad in the room dresses a certain way. I wanna give you a, um, a certain number of dad dress avatars. So here's the first one. This is Grill Master Dad. And this dad, he's so excited about Father's Day because he is going to um, do a brisket a different way than he's done before or a slab of ribs. And this is Grill Master Dad. So if you have Grill Master Dad in your house, point to Grill Master Dad. Next dad, um, this, is, uh, this is Bro Dad, you know, Bro Dad. And this is Tim Lukai, our, our men's pastor. And Bro Dad uh, is essentially the kind of gear, that all the men of Mariner's gear is Bro Dad gear. Uh, it's all sponsored by Bro Dads. And I don't want you to confuse bro dad with the next dad. This is hipster dad. Uh, bro dad, you could think it's the same as hipster dad, but very different. Hipster dad um, has long shirts and short coffee cups. The longer the shirt, the shorter the coffee cup, all right? So this is hipster dad. Um, any hipster dads at, at the house today? And then here's the next dad. This is common. <laughs> oh, this is bad joke dad or the dad joke dad, the one who always has what he thinks are um, the best jokes, all right? Any, any dad joke dads in the house? We love them too. Uh, all right, next dad is, um, this is DK, and this is, uh, this is coach dad. So coach dad, no matter what the occasion, is wearing sports attire. And honestly, I'm often uh, coach dad because Kay will say to me, you're not really going to wear athletic shorts to the kids' recital, are you? I'm like, baby, what's wrong? I'm, yes, I'm, wear, I'm for sure wearing these shorts to the recital. And that's Coach Dad. No matter what occasion, they can dress this way. And so some dads, some of us dress better than others. Some of us don't dress that well. We don't actually don't even think much about it. But all dads would agree that what we wear is not the most important decision that we make in our life. I mean, how we dress each day, it's not the most important decision that we make at all. And so there's many more important decisions that we have in our lives. And typically, as dads, what we do is we compare um, decisions to go this way versus this way before we make a decision. So, you know, what college do I want to go to? We weigh out options. Or what career path do I want to take? We weigh out options. Or uh, am I going to enter this relationship with this person? We weigh out options. Oftentimes, we will compare, not just dads, but all of us, we will compare choices that we're going to make and, and weigh them against one another before we make a choice. And for all of us, there are many more important decisions than what we dress that we make every single day in our life. But the most important decision that all of us make, every one of us, every one of us watching, we have this in common. The biggest decision you will ever make in your life is who or what you're going to worship. 
Who or what is going to get your affection, your attention? Who or what you're going to give your allegiance to? And the reason that this is the most important decision in your life is it impacts everything else about your life. Who or what you exalt? who or what you honor and what you worship, that choice, that decision impacts everything about you. And you could be thinking, um, yeah, I get that you're saying that, Eric, because you're a preacher and that's what preachers are supposed to say. But this is not just a religious conversation. And not only religious leaders like myself have challenged us with this question, who are you going to worship? David Foster Wallace is known as one of the most prolific novelists and authors in this century. And in fact, the LA Times said of David Foster Wallace that he's the most influential and innovative author in the last 20 years. And he, at a very famous commencement speech at Kenyon College, this is actually before he passed away, he challenged everyone who is listening to think about what they worship. And um, Foster Wallace, doesn't even, or he didn't even claim to be a Christian. Many people after his death have wondered where he was in his faith. He grew up in in, uh, a home with two atheist parents, two parents who did not believe in God. But even growing up in that environment and, and, and having all kinds of questions about the faith, he concluded that all of us have this in common. Every single one of us, we worship something. In fact, let me show you what he shared in his speech at Kenyon College. He said, here's something else that's weird, but it's true in the day-to-day trenches of adult life. So he's speaking to some college grads and he's saying, hey, listen, in the, the nitty gritty of adult life, what I'm about to tell you, it's true. There's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Again, this is a guy who wasn't claiming to be a Christian. In fact, notice what he says. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of good or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. That is a devastating and true statement. If you worship anything else other than your creator, that thing which you worship is going to eat you alive. And so here's what he's saying in the trenches of adult life, in the real nitty gritty of everyday living, you don't get a choice. You're going to worship something. In fact, Foster Wallace went as far to say that it's your default setting. You can't help but worship. And so this is the biggest choice you're gonna make. The biggest decision you're going to make in your life overarching, but also every single day, much more important than what dress you put on, is who am I going to honor? Who am I going to worship? And so we're going to look at a psalm today, Psalm 115. And this psalm is an incredible psalm because the psalmist basically asked that question, who am I going to worship? And he invites the reader, us, into the conversation, essentially comparing God with the little g gods of this world. And the psalmist is answering the question that people have asked the psalmist and have asked us, where is your God? Where is your God? Perhaps you've been asked that question. And in fact, David Foster Wallace was asking college graduates that question, hey, where are you gonna find your God? Where are you going to find who you worship And then in difficult seasons, like the season we are in now as a culture, perhaps as a Christian, someone's asked that to you with a bit of question or a bit of even wondering, maybe a disdain at times. Hey, where? Where is our God in this moment? When things seem so broken and falling apart, where's God? Where is your God? And so the psalmist is gonna answer that question. Now, here's what's really interesting about Psalm 115, which we're gonna read together in a moment is you'll notice in many of the Psalms that we're studying, there's a context given, like a prescript before the Psalm that helps you understand what was taking place when the Psalm was written. And there is no prescript in Psalm 115, which is essentially to say that this Psalm isn't for just one specific context, that it transcends any context we find ourselves in. 
that every single person throughout all cultures and all generations must answer this question, who are you going to worship? Who are you going to worship? And so we're going to see what the psalmist says. And here's what, what he's really getting after. He doesn't entertain the question of trying to prove that God exists. He actually answers it differently. He essentially says, hey, we're going to worship something, so let's compare. Let's make a really good decision here on who we're going to worship. Let's look at God, and let's look at the little g gods, these other things that we can worship, and let's see who's really worthy of our attention and our affection, because he agrees with David Foster Wallace that we're going to worship something, so let's step back, let's look at a list, let's evaluate, and let's really make a wise choice on who we're going to worship. All right, so Psalm 115. We're only going to read the first nine verses. I want you to see, the psalmist opens this way, not to us, Lord. If you have your Bible and pen, I notice it's all caps. This is uh, in the original language, the word Yahweh. This is God, the self-existing one, the one who rules and reigns over everything. Not to us, Yahweh, Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, and here is the tough question we're going to answer today, where is their God? Who's your God? Where's your God? Our God is in heaven. So the Lord, our God, is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. Their idols, their little g-gods, are silver and gold. They're made by human hands. They have ears, so these little statues that have ears carved on them, but they can't hear. They have noses carved on these statues, but they can't smell. They have hands, but they can't feel, feet, but they can't walk. They can't make a sound with their throats. Those who make them, this is verse eight, fascinating verse. This is why you get eaten alive if you worship something other than God. Those who make them are just like them, as all who trust in them. Israel, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. So the psalmist is going to compare and contrast the God, Yahweh, the self-existing one, with the idols, the little g-gods of the day, and ask us to choose which one we're going to. To worship. The psalm is essentially saying every one of us worships something at all times. This isn't just a religious thing or just a, um, a church thing. Every one of us at all times worships something. In fact, Origen, an early church father, he said it this way, what each one honors before all else, what before all things he admires and loves, this for him is God. So whatever it is right now in your life that you put before everything else, that's God for you. That's your God. And the psalmist is saying, hey, choose wisely who you're going to put before all else in your life. So there's three thoughts I'm gonna give us from this passage today that's gonna help us choose wisely on who we're gonna worship. Number one, I need to look at my notes because I just forgot what number one is. Here it is, number one. Uh, number one, we're going to see that our God is timeless and the gods are temporary. Number two, we're going to see that our God is powerful and the gods, the little g gods, are powerless. And then number three, this is why we want to choose wisely, we're going to see that we actually become like whatever it is we behold. So number one, our God is timeless, the gods are temporary. In the passage we just read, Yahweh, the self-existing one, is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. He's the creator. The idols, the little statues, they are created with human hands. So they are temporary. They are not timeless, but our God is timeless. And so when we're confronted with what we're going to worship, we have to understand from a Christian perspective, this is what we believe about God. We are confronted with the choice that we worship the everlasting God who never changes, who is faithful and consistent, or do we give our affection to something that comes and goes? The gods are temporary and he is timeless. Several years ago, I was uh, on vacation with Kay and we, this was, uh, we lived in Miami at the time and, and I was exhausted one summer and so we, uh, 
on VRBO found this, this one room place on the island of St. John. Uh, just one room in the whole place. And it was uh, on the back side of the island, so far away from where, the, where uh, cruise ships would go, where we would just be completely by ourselves and, and, and it would just be us. And it was, it was awesome. So we found this, this place that we rented on VRBO. And there was a couple who moved there from the Detroit area who have a house and they built this place that we're renting. And that's kind of how they have some income. And so they walked down when we got there to show us the place that we would be staying and to meet us. And I could tell they're from the States as I'm talking to them. And so I, I say, hey, how did you get How'd you get here on the backside of nowhere? I mean, this is incredible, but how did you get here? How'd you get here? I asked her the question and it, it triggered something in her about her dad. I said, how'd you get here? And she goes off and she said, my dad worked, and she men mentioned one of the big car companies that he worked for in the Detroit area. My dad worked and he, wor he was high up and he worked and he worked and he worked and they kept asking him to retire and he never wanted to retire and I rarely saw him and he was in the rat race and he worked and he worked and it never was enough. He worked and he worked and finally they made him retire and six months later he died because everything he worked for was now gone. And so I stepped back and I mean, you could just see the pain because what she was saying in that moment was, um, when his job was taken away from him, everything was taken away from him because his job was his, his God, his little G God. And his job is not timeless. His job, as much as he loved it, his job was very temporary. So we talked for a little while after that. And a couple of nights later, Kay and I were sitting on this beach, which was a ways from where the home was, but every night Kay and I would go sit on the beach together and watch the sun go down. It was awesome. And the, our host and hostess, so um, the man and his wife, they, they always would come down to the beach and, and he would walk around and she would walk around and they would swim in the ocean. And every single night I would watch as she was always searching for something on the beach. And I think it was like night three she starts waving her hands, hey, come over here, come over here. And so I, I run over and she has this, this rock in her hand and it's, it's yellow. And she's like, isn't this, I mean, she, I thought this was like a major deal that she called me over for. Isn't this the most gorgeous yellow rock you've ever seen? And I looked at it and it, it, it was a nice looking yellow rock, but it was a yellow rock. And so I'm like, yeah, that's, that's an amazing yellow rock that you have in your hand. And it was, it was, it was nice, but it was, a, it was a rock. And we talked for a little bit and I went back and I realized that she really traded one little G God for another little G God. She wanted to abandon the God of her father, career God, workaholic God. And she wanted to be on the backside of nowhere spending her life looking for the perfect little yellow rock. I know in the season that we're in right now, um, searching for a yellow rock could sound satisfying, but you know this, you know, it's not gonna really satisfy. And I went and sat back down and I wasn't judging her, I really was thinking of my own, my own heart. Of, that's exactly what I've spent so many wasted days in my life doing, that I've pursued my happiness in this and it doesn't satisfy. So I then, um, I, I switch from this to now I'm gonna find it in my career, then I'm gonna find it in this hobby, or I'm gonna find it in this goal that I want to see happen. And none of those little G gods, they, they, none of them satisfy. In fact, the little G gods in the psalmist culture, I could show you some possible pictures of depictions of these gods, but they're gone. They're gone. These little G gods, these statues that people worshiped, they're gone. But our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who I don't believe was a Christian, he actually said this though, which was fascinating. He said, if we've broken any idols, it is merely through a transfer of idolatry. This is what he was saying. He was looking at humanity and he was saying, you know, sometimes you go after this, a career, and then you, tr you, you go after something else, but you're always gonna go after something. You're always gonna transfer your heart and your affection to something. 
And he's right. We're never going to break idols unless, unless your heart gets captured with this one true God who is in heaven and loves you and sets his attention and affection on you and pursues you. And if he will capture your heart, then all of the little G gods of this world will be seen for what they are, nothing in comparison to him. So number one, the gods are temporary. He is timeless. Number two, our God is powerful. And the gods, the little G gods, they are powerless. Our God is powerful, but the little G gods, they are powerless. The psalmist is actually mocking the little G gods in the passage. The psalmist is saying, hey, it's a statue and it has eyes, but the statue can't really see. The statue can't see around the corner in your life. Hey, the statue has ears, but when you pray to the statue, the statue can't hear. Hey, the statue has a nose, but this, um, this statue can't really smell. Hey, the statue has hands carved on it, but this statue can't pick you up when you are down. But our God is very different. Our God is powerful and can deliver all of those things for you. Our God, he does hear us. Our God does see. Our God does um, have the power to lift us up. In fact, look at Psalm 33. The scripture says this about his mouth, he can speak. He spoke and it, this is about creation, came into being, he commanded and it came into existence. Our God is the God who speaks. Unlike these statues, it has a mouth but can't really speak, our God speaks. He spoke the wor world into existence and he still speaks to you. He is not silent, he is the ever speaking God. He speaks to us, his people, through his word. He speaks to us as we spend time with him. He speaks to us through other Christians in our lives. He speaks to us through creation. Our God speaks, he's powerful. Our God also sees. Look at 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Unlike the statues that have eyes but they can't see, our God actually sees. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Our God sees. He sees you. In your struggles, he sees. In your pain, he sees you. He sees. He sees around the corner in your life on things that you are uncertain on or unsure. He sees, he knows, and he cares. Our God sees, and our God also hears. When you come to him and you pray to him, he hears you. He longs for you to come to him and to pour out your heart to him because he always hears. And not only does he hear, but he has arms that can pick you up. He can move. Our God is powerful, and the little g gods, they are powerless. So as we think about who we're going to worship, we want to choose wisely. Notice what else the psalmist says. It's, it's really fascinating. The psalmist says that the little G gods, they have noses, but they can't really smell. Now, what does this mean? That these little G gods, they have noses, but they can't smell. Well, this is actually terrifying to people in that culture who bowed down, who paid homage to these statues with noses that couldn't smell. Because think about it, if your God can't smell, what does this mean? What does it mean if your God can't smell? It means that as you offer sacrifices to this God, that this God can't smell your sacrifice. Which means what? Well, it means that your sacrifice is not gonna be enough that you're gonna to have to offer a sacrifice over and over and over again because this God can't satisfy you and this God isn't satisfied. This God needs more and more of your sacrifice that this little G God is bloodthirsty, which is why David Foster Wallace says you'll be eaten alive. This little G God is bloodthirsty, wanting more and more of a sacrifice. Our God is different. Our God who is in heaven has a nose and he can smell, the scripture says. In fact, in the book of Leviticus in the scripture, over a dozen times as sacrifices are offered to the Lord, the scripture says that God smelled the aroma of those sacrifices and was pleased that our God can smell. Now, what does this mean? Listen, our God unlike the little g gods who are never satisfied, our God is satisfied 
and he's ultimately satisfied because 2,000 years ago, Jesus put himself on the cross in our place for our sins as the ultimate sacrifice for us, the once and for all sacrifice. And his death was an offering before the Father and satisfied the wrath of our Father and satisfied the holiness of God our God is satisfied because of the offering of Jesus. The little G gods in your life, they will never satisfy you and they are never satisfied. They'll keep asking for more and more of you, but our God is satisfied because as Jesus went to the cross for you and for me, all of my sin was placed on him and all of your sin was too. And God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus for us. The little G gods in our lives, they're never satisfied and they never satisfy. If, if I make my bank account my little G God, the bank account's never gonna say, I'm satisfied. The bank account's gonna ask for more and more. If career is your idol, your little G God that's before everything else in your life, your career is not gonna say, you've given enough, you've sacrificed enough, but Jesus, he doesn't ask you for a sacrifice. Jesus gave himself as the sacrifice. Jesus doesn't say to us, this is what makes Jesus so amazing, is church for us is not us getting together and yelling at one another to sacrifice more to this God who can't smell. No, the Christian faith is this glorious news that Jesus offered himself as the once and for all sacrifice for us and that God smelled the sacrifice of Jesus and he is satisfied. And because he is satisfied, he satisfies us. The gods are powerless and he is powerful. He is powerful. All right, last point, number three. So, we have a choice to make, who are we gonna worship? This God who is in heaven, who is timeless and powerful, or these little G gods who will eat us alive, these little G gods who won't satisfy, who are temporary and who are powerless. Our God is powerful, they are powerless. And then point number three, this is why we must choose wisely, because we are going to become like whatever we behold. Whichever choice you make, you're gonna become like the one you worship. Verse nine, I'm sorry, verse eight, the psalmist says this. Those who make them, those who make these idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. You become exactly like what it is that you worship. G.K. Beale is a theologian, he said it this way, we resemble what we revere for our ruin or our restoration. It's a great quote. So whatever it is that you worship, whatever it is that you revere, you're gonna resemble, and that's gonna either be for your ruin or for your restoration. And so when we worship Jesus, this is good news, he restores us. Didn't you even find that during our time of singing a couple of moments ago? I did. As I'm exalting Jesus and taking the focus off of me and my problems as Jesus is the center in that moment. I'm sensing the restoring power of Jesus as he brings joy back and peace back to me. Don't you sense that? That when you worship him and you put your affection and your attention towards him, don't you sense that he restores and he brings healing and hope to us as we worship him? If you worship him, if you behold him, you become more like him. You are transformed into his image, the scripture says, and you are being restored. But if we revere one of these little G gods, we actually were ruined. We're ruined because we become like whatever it is that we behold. In my generation, Chris Farley is known as uh, one of the, the most funny uh, comedians and actors that I, I grew up watching. And Farley said of himself that he idolized, his idol was John Belushi. And John Belushi uh, had a career path that Chris Farley idolized. And they both took a very similar career path. Belushi started with this comedy group known as Second City. And then he moved on to Saturday Night Live. And then he moved on to starring in uh, movies. And 
Same thing with Farley. He started with this Second City comedy group and moved on to Saturday Night Live and then started starring in movies. Belushi was known as a partier. I mean, he partied and was known for it. And Farley was a big partier and was known for it. Belushi died of a drug overdose when he was 33 years old. Chris Farley also died of a drug overdose and he was 33 years old. We become like whatever it is that we behold. Whatever it is that we revere, we start to resemble. So what we worship is really, really important. It's so important. And that's why it's so important for those of us who are Christians to constantly set our attention and our affection on Jesus because he's the one who restores us. David Foster Wallace, the famous novelist, as he ended his speech at Kenyon College, after he told them all, hey, your default setting is you're gonna worship something, he tells this parable to all of these college grads. He says, there's two fish that are uh, swimming in the ocean and an older fish comes to them one morning and says, hey boys, how you doing? How's the water? To which they swim away and one of them ask the other, what is water? What is water? Foster Wallace told that opening story and said, here's the reality is they were in water. They just didn't know what water was. And all of you worship something, whether you realize it or not. We're all in water. The name of his famous speech was called, This is Water, that all of us worship something. And he ended his speech this way. Worship power. Remember, we become like whatever it is we behold. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. If you worship one of these things, it will eat you alive. So choose wisely. Choose wisely. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. And what he was pleased to do was enter our world for us and sacrifice himself for us so that we could worship him and be filled by him so that we could know him and be known by him. 